Hello, good evening. Welcome everybody to Putting the Data into Practice, the best CLI trial presented by the VUF Foundation. My name is Sahar Sabri. I'm an interventional radiologist out of MedStar Georgetown in DC. I'm happy to be joined by my co-moderator, Eric Sosemski from Beth Israel in Boston and he's an interventional cardiologist. The Viva Foundation um, brings this webinar to you and it's a not-for-profit organization committed to advancing the field of vascular care through education, research, advocacy, and philanthropy. Uh, in addition to our education, you know, through the um, uh, webinars and conferences that you're familiar with, um, the foundation convenes the Vascular Leadership Forum and the Vascular Leaders Forum. We also support really marquee research trials, such as this landmark trial, the best CLI, and we also support the companion registry uh, for, this, uh, for this trial. As you all know, the best CLI trial has uh, provided a comparison between outcomes for patients with CLTI who underwent surgical or endovascular intervention. Today, we'll, you know, we're excited to delve deeper into these results uh, with the study leaders. We're so happy that they're here with us and with the, uh, our um, uh, leaders uh, from the VIVA Board of Directors. I'm you know, happy to introduce the panel. Um, we're excited to have the study leaders, Dr. Matt Menard, uh, as a vascular surgeon out of Brigham and Women's, uh, Dr. Kenny Rosenfield, interventional cardiologist out of Mass General, um, Dr. Alec Barber will be joining us uh, as well from Boston University of Vascular Surgeon. Um, the B Viva board members, Peter Schneider, vascular surgeon out of ECSF, Benita Chandra, vascular surgeon out of Stanford University, Dr. Tony Das, interventional cardiologist out of, out of Baylor Scott and White Heart Hospital, and Dr. John Kaufman, interventional radiologist out of Oregon Health and Science University. So um, next we will go with uh, our first presentation is by uh, study leader, Dr. Alec Faber. Um, um, it will present on the key clinical results of this trial. Good evening, everybody. This evening, I will present the clinical results of the best endovascular versus best surgical therapy for patients with chronic limb-threatening ischemia or best CLI trial. This trial was sponsored by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute and Additional support was provided by industry and physician societies, including Viva. Best CLI was a prospective randomized multi-center, multi-specialty pragmatic clinical trial, whose goal was to compare clinical effectiveness, functional outcomes, and cost in patients with CLTI and infrainguinal PAD who were candidates for both open vascular surgery and endovascular therapy. Patients with CLTI who had infrainguinal PAD were evaluated by non-invasive studies to corroborate that they had severe ischemia. Those considered to be high risk for surgery were excluded. Only patients who were judged by investigators to be candidates for both surgery and endovascular were included. Those patients underwent ultrasound of the great saphenous vein and imaging studies of leg arteries. An investigator credentialed in open surgery had to agree with one credentialed in endovascular that any given patient was a candidate for the trial. Because results of bypass are strongly influenced by choice of conduit and single segment saphenous vein is judged to be the best conduit for bypass, patients were placed into two cohorts. Cohort one included patients with single segment great saphenous vein, while in cohort two, patients randomized to surgery would be treated by alternative conduits, including prosthetic grafts. These cohorts were treated as separate parallel trials and not pooled. We chose to stratify our cohorts by clinical presentation, whether the patient had ischemic crest pain alone or tissue loss, and anatomy, whether or not there was tibial disease present, so as to balance randomization across these important variables. The hypothesis for cohort one was that bypass with single segment grade saphenous vein would outperform endovascular therapy. The hypothesis for cohort two was that endovascular therapy would outperform bypass with alternative conduits. Our primary endpoint was major adverse limb event or all-cause death. Male was defined as an above ankle amputation or a first major intervention to include either a new bypass, surgical interposition graft, surgical thrombectomy, or thrombolysis. This first major intervention was adjudicated by the Clinical Events Committee, as was the safety endpoints of myocardial infarction and stroke. We had a number of secondary endpoints. Best CLI was run across 150 sites in North America, Europe, and New Zealand. We had more than 1,000 investigators participating, representing vascular surgery, interventional cardiology, interventional radiology, and vascular medicine. 
best CLI advocated for multidisciplinary CLI teams, and to that end, three quarters of our sites have multidisciplinary participation. Here are the results of cohort one. There were 1,434 patients in cohort one. The crossover rate was 3.5% from surgery to endo and 0.4% for endo to surgery, and this was lower than predicted. The median follow-up was 2.7 years. The maximum follow-up was seven years. If you look at the baseline demographic characteristics, you would note that this is representative of a typical group of patients with CLTI. 20% had ischemic crust pain alone, and 67% had significant tibial disease. With respect to medical therapy, even though baseline, the medical therapy uh, uh, was relatively low, uh, at 30 days, 75% of patients were at least on one statin, 83% were on at least one antiplatelet agents, uh, and 6.7% were on a DOAC. In terms of risk causation procedures, uh, there were 698 uh, procedures in the open arm, 307 femoral popliteal bypasses, 115 popliteal tibial bypasses, and 276 femoral tibial bypasses. Out of 1,250 segments treated, 487 were in the femoral artery, 382 in the popliteal artery, and 381 in the tibial or pedal arteries. With respect to endovascular interventions, the most common endovascular intervention in the superficial femoral artery was placement of bare metal stents. In the popliteal artery, it was drug coated balloon angioplasty, and in the tibial artery, uh, it was plain balloon angioplasty, which currently is a standard of care in this space. Of note, only 7% of patients had plain balloon angioplasty only in their SFA or popliteal segment. Here are the main findings. The primary endpoint occurred in 42.6% of patients in the surgery arm and 57.4% of patients in the endovascular arm. With a hazard ratio of 0.68, surgical bypass was associated with a 32% reduction in male or all-cause death. This finding was driven by significantly more first major interventions in the endovascular arm. There were 74 above ankle amputations in the surgery arm and 106 in the endovascular arm was translated to a 27% reduction in amputations in the surgery arm. There is no significant difference in all-cause deaths. The Kaplan-Meier curve of the primary endpoint shows that surgical bypass significantly outperformed endovascular therapy. This difference was evident early and persisted throughout the course of the trial. The absolute risk reduction at median follow-up of 2.7 years was 10.3%. Patients randomized to endo, were significantly more likely to have first major interventions and significantly more likely to have an above ankle amputation. There was no difference in depth. With respect to subgroups, there was significant treatment effect favoring surgery for most subgroups. With respect to the total number of major intervention over the entire course of this trial, there were two and a half uh, uh, Fold higher incidence rate of major interventions over the course of the trial in the endovascular arm can tend to the surgical arm, and the curves appear to diverge. There is no difference in the safety endpoint of MACE, either at 30 days or over the course of the trial between arms. The question that we wanted to answer is whether the difference in curves was driven by early failure in the endovascular group. 99 of 233 of first major interventions occurred within 30 days, of which 15 were in the surgery arm and 84 in the endo arm. 81% of the interventions within the endo arm were treated with bypass alone. Technical failure in the endovascular arm was 15%. Of 108 cases of technical failure, 66 patients or 61% were treated with bypass within 30 days. We did sensitivity analyses where we excluded endovascular patients with technical failure and the primary outcome event or were censored within 30 days, or excluded endovascular patients with technical failure regardless of a primary event or censored within 30 days, or excluded endovascular patients with either a primary outcome event or were censored within 30 days. And the difference in male or death between the surgical endovascular arm did not change. Here is also cohort two. There were 396 patients 
in core two, which was followed for a median follow of 1.6 years and a maximum follow up of 5.1 years. There is no significant difference in the primary endpoint between surgery and endovascular in core two. There were significantly more major interventions in the endovascular arm. BEST had a number of limitations. It was a pragmatic trial with a pragmatic design. This could have led to selection operator bias in enrollment and intervention. Equipoise and eligibility were determined locally and likely to be variable. There was procedural heterogeneity. Cohort 2 was likely underpowered. Anatomic complexity is yet to be evaluated, but we are collecting angiograms and CAT scans uh, and will uh, do that uh, in the near future. The percentage of female patients at 28% was lower than targeted. The use of paclitaxel coated balloons and stents during enrollment was affected by the Katsanos meta-analysis. In summary, surgery was more effective than endovascular therapy among CLTI patients with adequate saphenous vein who were eligible for either strategy. It led to decreased male or all-cause death, fewer major amputations, and fewer major interventions. In patients who did not have adequate saphenous vein, there is no significant difference in the primary efficacy endpoint. There were no differences in preoperative mortality or MACE. Mortality and MACE were similar over the course of follow-up. In conclusion then, in CLTI, both surgical and endovascular riskization strategies are effective and safe. Bypass with adequate saphenous vein is a more effective strategy for patients deemed suitable for both open and endovascular approaches. Patients for candidates for limb salvage should undergo an evaluation of surgical risk and conduit availability. Bypass with adequate saphenous vein should be offered as a first-line treatment option for suitable candidates with CLTI as part of a fully informed shared decision-making. Level one evidence from the best CLI trial does not support an endovascular first approach to all patients with CLTI. Best CLI does support a complementary role for open and endovascular vascularization strategy and highlights the need for expertise in both for optimal care of these patients. Thank you. Thank you uh, for this presentation, Dr. Farber. Um, next, let's uh, uh, welcome Dr. Matt Menard. Um, to present um, some interesting quality of life data that came out of the trial. Uh, Matt, we're interested to, to hear about this. Thanks so much, Sahir and uh, Eric and the, and the panel, and um, thanks so much to Viva. So I have a closing slide actually thanking Viva, but I wanted to just start with it. Um, Alec mentioned it, but we have been incredibly uh, uh, fortunate to have the support that we did. Uh, funds ran a little short at the end, and Viva was absolutely critical coming in at a time when we were up against the wall, and their support was invaluable. So just a, a, a huge word of thanks to them. So I'm uh, going to present to you the quality of life uh, kind of uh, supplemental study that, that we did. And I just want to highlight one thing. Everyone knows this, but this kind of blows me away every time. So I'll just mention it again. There's just a staggering number of either diabetic or pre-diabetic patients in the U.S. globally. It's the same story. And so it's really important that we understand what we do for our PAD and CLI patients because there's just an enormous number kind of around the corner. So I'm going to jump right into what we did. We used uh, different metrics. There, there's only one real PAD specific. It's not CLTI specific. It's PAD specific metric for quality of life. It's FASQFAL, EQ5D, and SF12 are two generic uh, metrics that are well validated. They're used uh, in numerous uh, large trials. Uh, and we also used a pain um, scale that you're all familiar with. Uh, the MCID, I'm just going to uh, call out your attention to on the right column. It's a little bit of a confusing concept, but really all it is is a range of values that represent the change in the different metrics uh, or the surveys that have been designated as, as clinically important. So those are numbers to keep in mind as I show you the results. 
we surveyed folks at 30 days, 3, 12, 24 months, and every year thereafter. We used some fancy statistics that I won't uh, uh, delve into too much. Important in any effort like this is to figure out what your degree of missingness is or how many people actually filled out the surveys. Uh, we were fortunate to have 95% survey uh, success rate at the at baseline and numbers that are pretty respectable in this area of research. So often there's a tail off over time and we maintained around a 70% uh, response rate over the course of the trial. Uh, we did look to see if there was a difference in the missingness or the completeness in the different arms, surgical versus endovascular, and there was not. It was pretty uh, similar between the two groups. I'm going to show you the results of one representative uh, survey. This is VASFIQUAL, uh, and this is cohort one, and pretty much this sums it up for every single metric we used uh, in both cohort one and cohort two. So. Uh, Significant differences from baseline in both endovascular, which is in red, and surgery, which is in blue, over the course of the trial. So if you see the difference on the far right, that's four years out from baseline. And on the right where it says within group differences, that's endovascular baseline to four years and surgery baseline to four years. Those are highly significant results representing improvement in both groups with regard to quality of life. And you can see up above the MCID is 0.36 to 1.19, and those are both well above that uh, upper threshold. With, uh, with regard to between group endo versus surgery, uh, there was a statistically significant difference. It was 0 0.14 in the negative range in favor of endo, uh, but that's well below the lower limit of MCID. So this is felt to be uh, not clinically meaningful. This is EQ5D, a very similar results. The between group differences were not significant. And this is SF12, again, same result. Uh, a couple of the groups, subgroups were uh, significant between group differences, but they again were below the MCID in each case. With regard to pain, uh, same thing, but representing an improvement in pain uh, in baseline with both uh, revascularization efforts. With regard to subgroup analysis, there was no significant differences throughout. This is just vascular fall, but this was the same for all the metrics at all time points. Responder analysis is something that the statisticians amongst us use to make themselves look really smart and the rest of us look really uh, not smart. It's a little bit confusing, but all it is is a snapshot of uh, the percent uh, that, uh, that attained a significant response uh, over baseline. And here you see the difference between endo, endo and open is, or endo and bypass is negligent. This is one representative example. Again, vascular quality 12 months in cohort one. We did a more sophisticated analysis. Again, no significant differences across the board. Cohort two, again, representative slide. We did look to see if there were any predictors of non response. The only thing that shook out was above ankle amputation at 12 months. Uh, perhaps that might make sense, but if you had an amputation, you were less likely to fill out your surveys. So what were the limitations of this effort? Well, MCID thresholds have not been established for uh, all of the measures we used, and they're not defined for CLTI uh, specifically. The study was not designed to capture the impact of secondary procedures, and further analysis is certainly needed to identify the predictors of quality of life changes over time in a study such as this. The missingness, the analysis was done on only those in whom follow-up data was available. And one can imagine that non-responders, for example, those with frailty or following a major amputation may be a source of bias. So in summary, among patients that were deemed eligible for both, baseline quality of life was poor. That's not surprising. Both treatment strategies resulted in significant and meaningful improvement over baseline. This effect was seen early and was sustained and across all measures. And so in the patients with good vein, there were some statistically su superior uh, measures that were in favor of endovascular, but they were felt to be very small and below the threshold 
for clinically meaningful difference. And in cohort two, there were no differences between the two groups. And so in conclusion, uh, we believe that this data set represents the most rigorous quality of life analysis to date. And hopefully it's something that we can all build on. And it does provide more context for us to have those challenging discussions with our patients in terms of what they can expect team to treat them. Certainly more in-depth analysis is needed to, ben to better understand the burden of interventions and the impact of amputations. Again, wanted to thank Viva and all those who supported us over the course of the trial. Thanks very much. Great, thank you, Matt. Wonderful presentation as usual and really critical data that complements the <laughs> hard clinical endpoints that we saw from Dr. Farber. So appreciate you. Uh, presenting this data for us. For the audience, <clears throat> I just want to remind you there's a Q&A function, so please uh, ask questions. We have the ability to um, ask them as we go through the panel live. Um, but before we break out for the question portion of this, um, we are going to uh, introduce Dr. Peter Snyder. Um, and with Dr. Snyder's talk, thinking about lessons learned and future directions, we are going to ask the audience to answer the simple poll, were you surprised by the results of best CLI yes or no. So we'll leave this up for you to answer and we'll um, kick into Dr. Snyder's talk now. Thank you very much. Certain things, both therapies work, both surgery and endovascular with acceptably low major amputation rates, at least in the population studies. study. Both are safe with a low rate of perioperative death and MACE. The value of teams was reaffirmed. Bypass should be available as an option in appropriate patients. We're going to learn more about that. But it also highlighted in the best CLI that this is a vulnerable population. At 2.7 years, 33 to 38% of the patients had passed away and, and 10 to 15% had lost a limb. So the highlights of the best CLI trial. This is the first major RCT in the CLTI space, in my opinion. Since the uh, previous basal trial only had less than 20% of the patients with below the knee treatments. This was an unequivocal result, at least in the population in which the hypothesis was studied. Most of the patients had wounds, two thirds of the patients had tibial disease. It included all Wi Fi stages, included ESRD. Hemodynamics were required for enrollment. Experts were doing the revascularization the way they thought best and it also highlighted some opportunities for medical management improvement. So for example, at enrollment to the trial, a third of the patients were still smoking, 30% were not on statins and 28% were not on an antiplatelet agent. Now there's a lot more that we're gonna learn from the best CLI trial from accumulated information that's just waiting to be evaluated. There is a 61 page supplement to the New England Journal article, which, which is worth a look. We will also be able to uh, sub-segment the population by Wi-Fi and GLASS scores since the clinical report forms were written in this way. There is a plan for angiographic evaluation. This will help us understand the disease morphology that was entered into the trial and perhaps even uh, reconstruct the target artery path chosen. We need to know about wound healing. We need to know about other complications like readmissions and surgical site infections. Quality of life cost and technical failure of endovascular also require a deep dive. So with respect to technical failure, we'll come back to that. So every major RCT faces two key challenges. The appropriateness of the endpoint, that is, is the endpoint meaningful as an outcome of, in the care of the, con in the context of the disease process? And is it meaningful to the patient and the healthcare team? The other thing, is it generalizable? To which population should this conclusion be applied. So with regards to the appropriateness of the endpoint, this was in the uh, best CLI trial death or male, and male was above ankle amputation, new bypass, thrombectomy, thrombolysis, or open graft revision. I believe this is an appropriate endpoint. Amputation-free survival is not sensitive enough. Patency is not global enough. And there is substantial data on male collected in the literature for comparative analysis. And when you look at these endpoint curves, what you see is that the big difference was not uh, death and was not amputation. The big difference was with regards to major reintervention. So, and you can see that the curves diverged early and remained separated. So, this is where this concept of a major reintervention comes into play. 
it was 23.5% for endovascular therapy, 92 for surgery. So a large divergence uh, based upon early technical failure primarily of 108 cases of early technical failure in the endovascular group, 66 were treated with bypass within 30 days. The need for and timing of the reintervention was determined by the clinical site investigator, but all these events were adjudicated by an independent multidisciplinary clinical events committee. So understanding more about who these patients were and how they came to uh, receive a major reintervention and reach an endpoint is very important. And in other trials, we're familiar with the concept of CDTLR and CDTLR definitions typically include recurrent symptoms, a decrease in hemodynamics, and angiographic evidence of either uh, recurrent or residual disease. So hopefully we'll see that as time, as time unfolds. So what about technical success and failure, its definition, and how that interacts with evolving technology? Well, here's the definition of technical failure for endo occluded inability to cross. Well, how many of the technical failures were inability to cross? We know that retrograde access has been used mainly more recently in order to cross a lesion that can't be crossed from an anti-grade direction where the failure rate is probably 15 to 20 percent for anti-grade crossing especially for difficult popliteal and tibial lesions how widely was retrograde access used pacotaxel usage was lower than i would have expected and i think over time we'll understand that better but the real question is are there varying rates of adoption of new technologies uh, new techniques such as retrograde access by the different specialties. So 73% of the endo cases were done by vascular surgery, but nationwide less than half or almost half of the revascularizations are done by vascular surgeon. Could some of the endo failures have been treated with more endo, uh, more aggressive endo or possibly even been avoided? How generalizable is this result? Well, the enrolling team had to believe that there was equipoise. So what that means is that with respect to disease morphology, the anatomic complexity of disease in the enrolled patients becomes extremely important. And with respect to the fitness for open surgery, the medical judgment of the investigator and the team also becomes important. Put another way, if you think of fitness for open surgery on the up and down axis, high risk and low risk, sort of in a stylized manner, and you think of disease morphology on the horizontal axis, easy for endo and challenging for endo, they're gonna be patients with an easy or straightforward endovascular case where no one's gonna be willing to do a bypass. They're gonna be patients who are extremely high risk for surgery where no one's gonna be willing to do a bypass. The question is how, how big an area of this curve does that take up? And so when you look at the best CLI population, you say, well, it has to be the area where there was clinical equipoise in these two factors. But what if it looks more like this? So the things that could have helped us understand that better right off the bat are screen failures, which were not tracked, and there was current registry, but we do have more information coming. There's gonna be a review of angiograms. We also could potentially take patient level data in the best CLI population and propensity match it against larger databases like BQI, maybe even apply a risk score for preoperative assessment, just some ideas there. Now, what about uh, going forward? Well, the best CLI uh, had other challenges. Uh, imaging data was not collected prospectively. There were no hemodynamics beyond trial entry. There was no patency information. The withdrawn or lost follow-up was uh, over a quarter of the endovascular patients and almost a third of the surgery patients. We also don't know about patient preference. Many of these things could have been achievable, but really were financially uh, unaffordable or unsustainable in the trial. So in conclusion, endovascular first is not appropriate for all patients. I think that debate is over. The question is who exactly was in cohort one that had the good saphenous vein? In the studied population, they definitely had an advantage with bypass, but how much of an advantage is not clear to me. Additional analyses will give us more direction about the population that's best for each treatment strategy, key unknowns, severity of disease morphology, and medical risk of enrolled patients. In cohort two that did not have an adequate saphenous vein, there was no advantage for bypass, even those who were fit for surgery. Saphenous vein map and surgical risk assessment should be applied more liberally, in my opinion, and than it is in many programs, and every CLTI program should ensure that it has bypass capability. 
So the big picture, this was a real CLTI trial, an immense undertaking that has enriched our field. The organizers should be congratulated. Future trials will include mail, in my opinion. Uh, they will also be designed with best CLI as a benchmark. I think um, we do have a workflow problem. It's beyond the scope of this discussion, but even if you wanted to do a bypass on every CLTI patient tomorrow, we wouldn't have the OR time or the people power to do it. And then lastly, there, were, there are two questions that remain unanswered. When the first plan fails, have we done damage? This I think is an important question that probably won't be answered in this data, but is, it remains uh, a, a, um, a bit of a challenge. The other is what are the hemodynamic needs of a given patient? That is a given clinical scenario. How much improvement in perfusion do we need in order to resolve that patient's problem? As we work toward answering these questions, I think um, many of these um, uh, best CLI findings will influence our practice. And I think going forward, it's, it's really been a privilege to be involved in the trial. And thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you, Peter, for that wonderful talk. I think there's a lot to digest there. We are gonna have now 45 minutes for panel discussion. And I wanna thank everybody who's already uh, answer, or applying questions in the chat right now. We will be incorporating them into the discussion and, and hoping to resolve each one of them as we go through the next 45 minutes. But I'll, I'll turn everybody's attention um, to the poll results quickly. I, I'm, we can show them on the screen. Um, so for poll number one, we asked, were you surprised by the results of best CLI? And 49% of people said yes. 51% said no. So right down the middle. So we'll we'll be working yes. through that um, over the next few minutes. So I want to just take a moment. Um, we are here Eric, to- That's called equipoise. Yes, that's <laughs> called equipoise. Thanks, Ken. I just want to take a moment to recognize, you know, we're here to discuss the landmark trial um, that we've seen in the last 10 years. And in doing so, we're going to ask hard questions. Um, Matt, has put himself and as well as Ken and Alec on the stage to answer the hard questions. And I wanna recognize first how much effort went into this study. We, we all can have differing opinions about many aspects of it, but this is making, making our field better. NHLBI funding is incredibly hard to obtain, conducting a randomized trial over so many sites across the world in a very challenging population. And these three investigators flew across the world to each of these sites to get these trial done collected extra data, got extra money, everything that we asked for. So I, I just wanna recognize the Herculean effort of all the investigators and everything that we discuss here is in really the best interest of our patients in science, but has nothing to do with the amazing effort placed on this trial. So um, on that note, we're gonna to move to our poll number two and um, our first question of the evening that will come from Sahar. So I'm gonna read this poll in brief. What proportion of your CLTI population <clears throat> do the best CLI results apply to? And while you vote that, we're gonna move back into our discussion, Sahar. All right, so um, so while they answer the, the poll here, um, let me just ask Kenny about, um, you know, the uh, number of screen fails that, uh, that we looked at in the study. Um, was that a, was that surprising or um, expected? Um, and you know, with with a number of, of screen fails, compare can you compare it to other to other um, RCTs? Um, does that mean that the study can apply to a the general population or not? Um, so here, thanks, and um, I'll put my two cents in about um, about Viva and about the trial. Thank you, Eric, and and others for acknowledging the amount of work and effort and energy that this has been a labor of love. Um, and it is, it has been in the interest of trying to find, uh, get to truth for our patients. Um, I think, um, and, and I, and I also want to thank Viva. Viva was really, really the first organization to really step up and provide a substantive amount of support for this trial, without which we would not have gotten to the end point. Um, in addition, supporting a registry that's actually post hoc, um, uh, done in association with Duke that will hopefully provide us more of a backdrop to answer some of the questions you're asking, Sahir, about, um, you know, which patients were enrolled. Uh, the reality is that that there was not a robust, um, we started out with a robust sort of screening 
uh, mechanism where we watched, we, 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 we tried to see all the patients that were screened and all that failed. But um, really, as the trial moved along, it was really challenging to capture all of the patients that were really looked at for the trial. So I don't think the denominator is, is accurate when you look at the screen failures that we, that we presented. Um, and so the reality is we really don't know um, which, what the percentages of patients from each of our sites was enrolled. We had some sites that enrolled a, a, a quite a substantial number of patients. You know, I think about USC and Boston University, um, but um, then there were other sites that did, did not enroll so many patients. So we don't really know um, a lot about the sort of numerator and denominator. So here, um, and, and I think we're going to learn more. I think um, what Peter suggested, which was a beautiful talk, by the way, thank you for that, um, about propensity matching and and um, looking at, you know, the, the drilling down more on the patients that were enrolled, both from a, um, from a, uh, a demographic standpoint uh, and, and surgical risk and so on and so forth. And from an anatomical standpoint, we're, we'll, we'll hopefully learn a lot more as we do that. To me, that's the most exciting thing that, that what's the most exciting thing about this trial is not what we've already presented. It's what we're going to learn as we uh, unravel the, the details and dig, you know, unpack the trial, so to speak. I'm not sure if I've answered your question, Sahir, but um, uh, I tried. <laughs> I think that was, that was great, Ken. Uh, you know, to follow that up, you know, Matt, you know, there's um, lots to follow up as there is in any trial. There was withdrawals. Anything that stood out in terms of trying to keep patients followed and enrolled? And I know this is quite a challenge, but was there was this something you expected? Did you guys have some tricks in mind to try to keep investigators following these patients? And, and how did you deal with them? Um, well, uh, thanks for the, the question, Eric. So any, any investigator... Peter and Vanita and John, others on the on the panel will know as investigators, but we we were quite good at hounding people. So one of the things that we did is late in the stage of the trial, um, we really made an effort to 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 get that number as low as we could in terms of loss to follow up. It's it's a little bit of a misleading number with regard to withdrawn. Withdrawn includes Patients that, for whatever reason, just said, you know, I'm, I'm tired of this and I don't want to fill out your surveys anymore and I don't want to be part of the trial. But it also includes patients that were at centers that we uh, chose to close. We didn't want to do that, but we had to make some very hard choices. And if a given center was not enrolling quickly well and we didn't have the funds to support that, then we sacrificed some patients and those were lumped into the withdrawn. I, I don't have any reason to think that that was biased in one direction or another, but if you're a, a card-carrying statistician, you know, that introduces a level of bias and unknown that you can't get around. So that's sort of uh, one, one answer to that point. I, I wonder if some of those loss to follow-ups could be located at least from a survival standpoint, much in the way that we did it retroactively after the DCB pivotal trials had a number of patients lost to follow up. You probably would have to ask one of those card carrying statistician. We just happened to have one on the uh, on the call there with uh, with Eric. Um, what do you think, Eric? Could could we find some of those people? Could we find out if they also got amputations if they were Medicare members? So Peter, yeah, let me great question. There, yeah. Eric, even before you answer that, so. I should have mentioned it, but we had a number of protocol amendments over the course of the trial, five in total, and the fifth one was specifically aimed at that. We had a, a redone consent form the patients had to do to allow us to track them, even if they were due from the trial, uh, through the mechanisms that you're talking about, and, and that actually proved very helpful. So we feel like, so the, the loss to follow-up rate was, uh, I think, around, uh, 10% or even 8% lower than it, and we had actually predicted it to be. So the number that drives the number that you quoted, Eric, is the withdrawn. Um, so it's challenging, Peter, even with that mechanism in place, we still struggle to, to identify everyone, but we did do that and that was very helpful. Didn't mean to interrupt you there, Eric, but. 
I, I think you I think you addressed the issue and you know there are ways to do this but I think that that's the best way is to try to go back and track it down from the site so great um, can we just uh, bring up the uh, poll number two results um, John let me bring you in you're one of the study leaders and uh, working the executive committee for, for the for the trial um, you, you know we see here the the numbers that um, you know more than 50 percent um sort of around you know 31 percent so it's kind of like divided you know almost in thirds um so in your practice john and, and just looking at the study and just looking through through the data what do you think is the applicability of, of this and, and i think uh, peter showed us a really nice graph here of of which patients are really enrolling in this diet and on this in this trial so what do you think the uh, you know in the proportion of the of the of the population fits fits the uh, uh who are enrolled in the trial yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Aaron. And I'm just going to say a few things before I give you my evasive answer. But first, uh, Peter, that was an incredible <laughs> talk. Uh, I think you, you you nailed a lot of the really key points. Um, I, I think in talking about the what we were just discussing, you know, the impact of COVID is <laughs> going to be really interesting. And, and as other trials that have been conducted during the same period come forward, uh, it might be interesting to see how their loss to fall up rates uh, were, you know, compared to trials that took place outside of a pandemic. The, you know, I think this re probably reflects individual practices. If you are in a referral center and you're seeing only uh, carefully selected patients who have failed multiple other interventions and they come to your practice, um, you might uh, have a very different answer than if you're in the community um, seeing patients who are for the very first time presenting um, with CLTI and never had a prior intervention or have not been particularly well ma medically managed. So, I, you know, I don't know what the right answer is going to be. Um, greater than 50%, I'm not sure. You know, in our practice, that would be pretty high. Um, and in our institution, it depends whether you're at the university or the VA. So, you know, I was kind of pegging us at about between 30 and 50%. I didn't really like that 30% showed up in two places. So uh, I think we're kind of straddling that um, depending on the the patient population. But I think it really is going to depend on the local expertise uh, that's available. And I think the comment that uh, Peter made about making sure that you've got the correct local expertise is, is sort of a prerequisite for applying these results because you may be in institutions where uh, that, that one part of the expertise is not particularly available. You know, and th this can still help you inform what you want to do with your patients. So hopefully I evaded I'll, your question appropriately. I'm just going to ask that we show the poll results one more time, and I will own the uh, two 30 percents there. That was on the statistician Eric here. Um, as we as we just digest this information, um, the next question is going to go to uh, Dr. Chandra. Um, so Benita, you know, this is a study that was conducted over eight years, and we think a lot about what happens over a time period like this, and especially in a, a evolving field like. Uh, peripheral artery intervention. We've seen a lot of changes in endovascular techniques and devices. Um, we've seen a lot of heterogeneity in training programs for um, all of the specialties and also on the surgical side, um, changing potentially in terms of how much open bypass is being exposed to. So we just want to get your uh, take on how much of this is influenced um, and what, what do you think the influence of time has on this trial? What do you think represented what we're doing now? What do you think did not represent what we're doing now. Yeah, thank you, <clears throat> Eric and Sahar and um, all of this esteemed panel for having me. And I think that's a really great question. Um, I don't think there's any, any, you know, I think this is just inherent to the challenge of a really thoughtfully designed study, but the study was a pragmatic study, right? And so I understand designing it that way, but what happens is you get this sort of <laughs> that comes with, um, you know, not really defining every little aspect and every little procedure. And with over eight years of time, there's no question, and COVID and drug-coded technology uh, controversy, certainly our practice patterns have changed. I would argue, particularly for CLI, our technologies, our tools, our understanding in terms of vessel prep, vessel sizing, uh, options for luminal gain have all changed. And it's unclear and difficult at this point to really tell whether that's been um, demonstrated uh, with this data. And I think as we get more data, as we get more anatomic data, we'll be able to know. The other side of it is 
Absolutely. I mean, even within my period of time of my career, and I'm a program director, I mean, I would argue that my residents and trainees right now are not well prepared to go to up to 50% bypass, um, particularly for critical limb ischemia. I mean, this is a, uh, it's been a, a very sort of, it's been dramatically changing. And as Peter already mentioned, more than 50% of CLI interventions are not done by surgeons, right? And so um, I think this is, it, it's an interesting aspect that will uh, potentially change our paradigm to some degree in terms of our education and our experience. Um, I definitely think my residents are excited about best CLI. I'm not going to lie. They're, they're happy to do a bit more um, open bypass uh, when they hadn't been for a while, but uh, a lot remains to be seen. And I think my last little point is 40% of the bypasses, despite I think it was 67 or 70% having tibial disease were fempop. Um, and I'm, that's one of those sort of questions that I think we'll better understand when we get, when we get more anatomic information, right? Um, you know, I think what we're seeing is a change in even the disease where critical limb ischemia patients are becoming increasingly complex and increasingly infrapop, um, which I think is a challenge for both endo and, and um, as well as open and not necessarily reflected with the approaches that we've done here. So I think I did it. A, a better job at evading the question than John did, but hopefully answered a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think you did. Uh, let me bring t Tony Das in, and um, let's talk about the you know an issue that's been brought up you know quite a bit, which is the early technical failure, and it was you know high as, as uh, fifteen to twenty percent. And um, and and you know, if looking at these numbers, comparing to the Bezel trial in the early 2000s, you know, had a 20% technical failure. And um, you know, we already heard about the um, not um, not enough use of advanced techniques such as alternate access reentry device devices. And um, you know, the issue of um, the majority are done, um, you know, by by one specialty. Um, what do you think, you know, how do you interpret these results based on your own, you know, clinical experience and, you know, you know, how big of an issue it is that there's such a, 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 a high technical failure, um, you know, early, especially in crossing. Sorry, thanks for the question. Uh, you know, this is really a difficult uh, trial to interpret and apply generally, as everyone has already mentioned. I think uh, it took a long time to enroll this trial, partly because there's a complex uh, te technological um, enrollment. There was a lot of sites, many of which stopped enrolling or didn't enroll. So I'm a little cautious to sort of adopt the results of the trial in a lot of ways. The technical success rate, um, you know, is greater than 80% for most endo uh, heavy facilities, including probably many of those that are on this call and that are listening. So I thought that those results were probably not um, really generally applicable. In addition, most of these newer techniques, or you call them new, but really for a decade, I think alternative access and reentry devices, atherectomy and drug elution have evolved over the course of the trial. So the trials are basically snapshots in time when the, the, the field continues to grow. So it's a little hard to apply it uh, in general. And then the other thing, and Matt mentioned this, and that is it's a little hard to adopt a trial result where only 40% of cohort one really finished the trial. Granted, this is a very sick population, 25 to 30% died, but 27 to 31% were lost to follow-up either for sites closing or not be willing to answer the follow-up um, questionnaire. So again, if, if you are comfortable with um, you know, that way of evaluating the patients, a 15% failure rate because you're not using alternative access, then I would say, yes, maybe this applies to your center. But others have mentioned that local practices and experience really do change uh, your technical success rate and your overall, um, uh, you know, patient population. This population was not indicative of many populations that are facility and others. It's not most, it's mostly Caucasian without renal failure, uh, previously untreated limbs. I suspect that many of these things don't reflect local practices or experience. And then it's a little hard to adopt uh, these findings or at least to adopt them without being cautious. Um, you know, at our center, we have a multidisciplinary experience. We have at Baylor Scott and White, we have a high risk team that looks at these complex cases and we need to be better about it everywhere uh, for sure to be able to decide 
when patients really do fit the criteria that are very specific in this trial. I mean, the investigators said it themselves in the trial and in the paper. It says that our study has several limitations. The trial results may have been influenced by selection and operator bias as a consequence of the pragmatic design and implementation. So eligibility was really determined locally and varied significantly from site to site. So for our center, I'm not sure it's totally applicable, but I do think that it, it really does engender what I think is what the goal of this trial is, and that is to increase the uh, cross-collaboration across specialties to be able to look at these complex cases and to be able to look at them with multidisciplinary approaches. The other thing that I've heard kind of from folks uh, is to apply this trial to patients that are not CLTI, and I think that's a really um, dangerous thing to do. This was a CLTI trial, and that only makes up about 10% of the PVD population, and to extrapolate this to any other population in vascular would probably also be a mistake. So kind of in general, I think it's difficult to um, the actual anatomic evaluations of these patients, we're going to learn a whole lot more. Great, great comments, Tony. The, the next question um, I'm going to take from our chat. So there's several um, of our, pa our participants tonight who are questioning about the um, really the, the endo kind of pathway. So Ken, I just want to talk to you just for a moment. You know, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the devices that were used for endovascular. Um, the endovascular pathway, you know, many people practice doesn't end with one procedure. Um, and then oftentimes people are brought back to the end of suite before they would be considered to move over to a bypass. How do you think about all of the different ways we treat patients in our clinical practice versus how we've set this up in the clinical trial? And how does that reflect kind of what your practice is, which I know uh, better than anyone? Well, it's a really good question. So I, I'll just say at the outset that the original um, trial design was uh, such that you reached an end, an end point if you had any repeat intervention, even a minor reintervention. And we changed that very early on before, you know, in the, well, while designing the trial, um, saying that, well, a, the endovascular is a strategy. And that means that you, um, when you uh, approach somebody with an endovascular approach, you, you accept the fact that you might need to touch up a, uh, um, one area or another, um, and do an, a minor intervention or another intervention, frankly. Um, and we accepted that as not being part of male. Um, male was uh, defined, if you look at the paper, as being you know a major limb intervention, meaning bypass basically. Uh, and in the case of a bypass graft, it was a, another jump graft. It wasn't a touch up of the distal anastomosis of a bypass, for example. So the, th the same thing applied to both. Both both um, arms of the tr both uh, cohorts, um, not cohorts, both um, study groups. Um, that said, I mean the in the the outcome the 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 uh, outcome of, of an intervention, as we all know, we don't have a well defined hemodynamic um, way to measure consistently what represents a satisfactory or good outcome from a an endovascular approach and, and the surgical approach i mean i think a successful bypass graft is usually pretty straightforward uh, although I, you know i'm not a surgeon so um you know matt and peter could comment and and um uh, uh better about that but um uh and and vanita as well i i but i think that in the endo world we all know that you that, that some people will accept. Well, I've done it. It's pretty good. It looks great. I'm I'm done, um, and that may not be sufficient. And and the the reality in this trial is that we had to accept that the uh, endpoint of the endovascular procedure was up to the individual operator, uh, and and their determination as to whether they would bring the patient back for a touch up um, or just abandon ship was really up to the uh, an individual operator. And that's that's. That's something we have to live with. We're gonna we're gonna learn more as we unpack it. You know what what constituted um, a technical failure. You know within the first three months, I think most of the technical failures 
occurred um, actually within the first month, but actually if you really look at three months. And and you can envision all different kinds of scenarios would account, which accounts for that, whether it's you know just not achieving a, an adequate result or not crossing. Everybody's talking about not crossing. I, I actually think it's it may be more that um, they they crossed and they got what they thought was a satisfactory result, but it wasn't quite good enough. Um, and and some people might have brought those patients back, and some some people might not have. And it's it's really uh, all over the map. We're going to find out more. I hope. Because that's actually real, obviously incredibly important to understand that that group of technical failures and what procedures were done initially, what was it considered to the to be the endpoint, but by, by those individual investigators. I'm not sure we're going to be able to answer all those questions. We're going to do our best to do so. Yeah, thank you. I mean, we really need to know the degree of complexity. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Matt. You know, I just wanted to respond to some of the the comments. Oh. You know, all have been been great, and echo the comments about Peter's talk. It was it was spot on, and a whole bunch of things. I just I want to really dispel the concept that people could do what they typically do. This was a the the benefit of a pragmatic trial is in fact that we're not tying anyone's hands, so people could do exactly what they did every day for the ten years prior to. We have an evolving technology committee that was headed up by John Kaufman here on the panel that looked at drug elution, that looked at um, uh, uh, shock therapy, that looked at any new technology that came along. There was only three. All three of them made it into the trial. So if you wanted to use that, you could use it. No one is saying that if you had a balloon, if you had an endo option and the rules were such that you could bring a patient back up to four days to finish or to change or to do a different access. If you tried and failed antigrade, you could bring it back up to four days later and try retrograde or any other endo technique you wanted. Even another person on your team could if you felt that they were gonna be better suited to it. But if you felt that the, the wound was degrading or there was some issue, uh, you were not in any way forced to, to go to a surgical bypass. I'll also highlight that all those folks that did have an early bypass in intention to treat, they are then still uh, interpreted as having undergone endovascular. So it's quite possible that the results would have been different had that not been the case. Again, it's as treated versus intention to treat. But um, I also wanted to highlight that you know our use of paclitaxel the moment that the Katsonas paper came out exactly matched the national average. It was 40% across the board, and that was exactly what the DQI data says our people are doing. So I just feel like this is a real world trial. What it's not are you know the endo experts of the world, the top 5% endo folks that never have a technical failure and, and everything works beautifully, but it also doesn't include the top 10, you know, percent best surgeons on the planet. It, it it really does involve anyone who treated CLI at these participating sites. And one of the part of the tension is that there's this concept of best endo, but it's it's not in the guidelines. It's not, you know, codified to the point where, you know, folks at Viva kind of have a good sense of it, but it's not as well established it as as surgical bypass. And so we purposely put cohort two back in so as not to disadvantage uh, endo and have it just go up against the best case surgical scenario. So I just feel like uh, to be fair to who's in the who's in the trial. And again, everyone's doing a lot of work to to um, to drill down and answer the questions that people want to see. Matt, just to to push you on that because we've gotten a few questions on this. You know. The, the technical success was, you know, at the site decided, um, and, and we know that the um, number or the percentage of operators were primarily vascular surgeons on, on both arms, 75%, I think, on endo, obviously 100% on surgery. So, you know, how, do you, how did you guys deal with the fact that you have a primarily a surgic, surgical operator with a surgically cleared patient with a good conduit um, and the ability to cross over to surgery without you know, a more central adjudication or, or looking at true endo success. But I think that's the question that's come up a lot is, 
you know, that we, we try to do this in a multidisciplinary way. How did you, how did you guys feel about that approach? Was interventionists consulted before moving to that bypass? Because we know most of these events have been real early um, in, in, as was shown in Alex's presentation. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Kenny can address it as well. You know, the, the way the trial was designed, I don't know if it's, someone mentioned it earlier, but one person credentialed for open had to agree that there was, you know, the patient was a good candidate or an appropriate candidate. The word used was appropriate candidate for surgery. One person credentialed for endo had to be a different person, had to agree the patient was appropriate for endovascular. Who actually did the case could be decided, you know, was decided locally. And, you know, what happened after the index procedure, again, the whole concept was a collaborative team. Um, and ideally, as what one would hope in the real world, the best folks would then, you know, get the nod to do the procedure or to do the reinvention. The, the rules were before any major reinvention, the team had to get together again. And it also had to be a group decision to reintervene. It wasn't, uh, you know, I don't like my result. I'm going to go do a bypass. It was the same CLI team again, making a collaborative decision on what they thought was the best thing. Did that happen every time? You know, hard for us to know. But um, again, we we were purposely trying to make it real world, and you know, to the degree possible. Great. Um, thanks, Matt. Let's let's move to talk about the study endpoints. And um, can you put a uh, poll question number three? Um, so you know, in, in best CLI, you know, is a decision to to add major interventions um, as one of the endpoints. And you know, in the prior trials, amputation-free survival was was one of the you know was the the main endpoint. So um, you know, let me ask Peter about this. I know you alluded to it, and you mentioned that amputation-free survival is, is potentially lacking. Um, why is this, I mean, interpreting this versus Bezel versus some of the other trial becomes harder when, you know, major re-intervention um, with, with NAIL um, you know, had a significant impact on the outcomes here. So can you just comment on this? Uh, I mean, is this the appropriate... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just, you know, I, I don't know anything. I'm just here to learn. I, I, and I, I'm just going to add my two cents. But I don't think amputation-free survival is, it, it's just, it's at 50,000 feet. We need to get down to the tree lines where we can see things in detail, at least. And I, I think that's what, what the major re-intervention adds. Now, to be fair, if somebody gave me a piece of paper and a pencil and said, okay, go off and design a better trial. I don't know that I could do it. One that pushes the limit, that that gets you a massive amount of information, that that goes as far as the, you know, NIH is willing to go, as far as everyone can possibly go, and uh, probably Kenny and Matt and Alec could have all been concert pianists by now with the ten thousand hours they each spent on this thing. But nevertheless, I think major reintervention gets us a little closer to where the patients are, and. I, I can't be a super strong advocate for it, but I'm becoming more convinced that we need it. So for example, there's a lot of male data in the literature for comparative analysis. The one thing is, and just going back to the question answer you just had with uh, with Kenny and and with Matt, and that is has to be controlled. You know, if you're doing a pivotal trial for a new device and you're including CDTLR in the primary endpoint, that has to be adjudicated by typically a core lab because they're looking at angio, they're looking at hemodynamics, and they're looking at symptoms. So that same rigor, I think, for male to be a, a really excellent endpoint, and this is where a deep dive is going to help us a lot, um, as Matt already alluded to, to really understand how it was applied and really understand that if we all get comfortable that these were reasonable decisions, then this uh, trial carries even greater weight, in my opinion. Thanks. Um, can you show the poll results, please? So it seems like the, the majority, um, the majority ag ag agree that uh, major um, interventions should be, should be included. Um, there's no equipoise here, Ken. So, um, but uh, so let me, uh, John, let me just ask you, um, there's a question here in, in the chat about, you know, the, the patients who we have, you know, the number of patients, 118 patients who f failed, um, um, you failed their endo uh, to start with early, early intervention. 
um, if we exclude these patients and we look at the technical successful patients on the endo arm and the technical successful patients on the surgical arm, should that be a, a more favorable comparison? And we'll, we'll, we'll get also Matt's take on this. Yeah, it, you know, I, it's tempting and you look at those curves and you say, if you just didn't have that early trying to drop off the endo, it, this is not, I, I don't think this is about trying to prove endo is the, really the best or certain. It's, it's about trying to figure out what is sort of the, the right treatment for each the patient in front of you. And you do have to recognize you had in the, in the cohort one, a lot less variability technically, although I'm, you know, everyone does surgery a little differently. I recognize that the anastomosis might be different or so there is going to be variability, whereas a, a, a tremendous amount of variability in the endo, which is just, that is just the way life is. There is not one endotherapy to apply. Fortunately, that the trial didn't do that because the results would have been really difficult as, as you know, as things evolve. So I'm not sure, you know, quite that that would be, I, I would not be in favor of that, to be honest, but I would be, what you know, the goal of looking at the uh, images, really getting good anatomic data, digging into this to understand what those issues were is really going to be critical. And I think it's going to inform kind of where, you know, how you apply this data going forward. Um, I, th I, I think, uh, and I it, it just, I think major reintervention is the patient centric way of, of looking at these outcomes. Just that's just my opinion. So, so uh, can I just uh, add to that? I, you know, I think that that question is is kind of a little bit misses the point of the trial. <laughs> the point was, when you're faced with a patient, what is the first treatment that you should offer them based on what you know about the patient and what you can anticipate from the outcomes? Uh, I'm not saying this trial answers that question 100 percent at all, but um, but you know, to take as an outcome. Once you've achieved technical success, you know, let's the randomize at that point. That's kind of foolish. I mean, that that doesn't make sense. What the trial did show is, I mean, I think we're 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 some of the points of the trial are really important and shouldn't be overlooked. I mean, this is the first trial that looks prospectively at a large group of patients undergoing endovascular treatment for CLI or CLTI. And it shows that, well, if you do achieve a technical success, it, it, you know, then the the results are are comparable to surgery the the two the two uh curves are 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 parallel after that first 3 months and so you can achieve good wound healing with both strategies and just one other comment about about um patient outcomes uh and what matters to the patient John you sort of mentioned it but actually i think it's really interesting is the quality of life data that that Matt uh showed um Vanita you're shaking your head and i'm i'd love to hear your take on this but but the point is that even though the endo group had higher number of reinterventions and actually twice as much, twice as many reinterventions, and even though they had, um, you know, they didn't uh, do that su surgery was was better in cohort one overall. Um, the patient report outcomes are the best that we have is a quality of life. Um, we need to do better on measures of quality of 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 of, of patient of PRO, but they all reported basically similar quality of life improvement. So it suggests that patients may be willing to accept, you know, of course it differs with individual patients, but that overall the patients were accepting the fact that they had higher interventions and even higher, slightly higher amputations, but their quality of life was reported as being e equally as good as had they had surgery. I, I don't know, Vanita, I'll, I'll, I don't want to take over here, but it, you know, what is your, you're shaking your head. So I, I'm, I'm interested in what your thoughts are about that. No, I, I think I just agree with you and I, I'm just really glad you brought it up. I mean, to me, the, the, the most important relevant patient outcome is, you know, at least in this case is quality of life, right? And, and not necessarily major reinterventions. And so how do you explain that discordance? What does that really mean? What are we missing? What really impacts our patients? And yes, I completely agree. You know, there is limitations to quality of life 
uh, you know, evaluations as well. But, but how do we explain that discordance? What are we missing here in terms of, you know, some of the aspects of our open interventions? I mean, even though it wasn't as big of a difference, the amputation rates were even higher, right? In cohort one with endovascular, yet still the quality of life was not different. So, so how do we explain that? You know, I think that's and Kenny. You stole my show card there. That was my uh, question for Benita. But <laughs> sorry, you know, I think yeah, I think some of the stuff that will be helpful again as we get into this is you know looking a little bit about the the post surgical pathway. You know, we don't know much about um, infection, um, prolonged you know readmission stuff like that. Maybe in that where some catch up in quality of life comes. The other thing that's important to remember is the survival at one year is so poor for this condition, and so making this a patient centric. Uh, decision includes all of these variables, and that's why Matt's presentation was just so important to supplement the primary results we saw from um, the main trial. We're going to move on um, next to our, our third topic, uh, and that's going to be the impact on future practice. And you know, I think that to do that, the um, first thing we're going to do is add this poll question to the to the board. Um, is vein mapping accessible to you within 48 hours, within seven days? within 14 days or greater than 14 days, John, that's um, not 14 redundant. That's uh, two different thresholds there. So um, we're gonna leave that question open for a moment. And as we do that, we're gonna throw it back to Tony. So Tony, uh, how are you going to approach your practice now with these results in mind? Are you going to think about vein mapping at the time of other non-invasive imaging you do or do it before bringing to lab? Um, do you have a surgical risk assessment pathway or documentation that you plan to use? Well, tell us a little bit about what you plan to do now. Yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, er everything is local, right? So as I mentioned previously, we actually have a high-risk team for complex vascular patients that we review uh, along with the surgeons, and we have a PACMA committee that looks at outcomes in complex cases and what should be the best thing to do. So that actually exists at our center. But having said that, I think the quality of life data sort of puts the patient at the center of making at least the initial choice. When we say uh, endo first is not the best option for some of these patients, I think that it's a little bit tricky when you say that as a blanket statement, when in my experience talking to the patients, they are a little hesitant to uh, accept surgery as their first option. Uh, and certainly, as Kenny mentioned, even if they needed a touch up or a minor procedure for uh, you know, revascularization at some point, they're more willing to do that. And that's reflected in this quality of life. So I think that it will make us a little bit more cognizant about uh, understanding if the patient does have failure or multiple failure, is there a vein, you know, a single saphenous vein uh, option available? And if that's not true, which we know statistically for this complex patient subset is frequently not true, then at least it puts it on the table or it takes it off. Uh, and the cohort one data suggests you should be thinking about that. So I think that we get a little bit into a rabbit hole when we start doing endo. We have to come out of that and look at our multidisciplinary teams and say, is this a good patient for surgery? So will it change the way we specifically do this? No, but I think it opens up our eyes to the fact that if a patient has a recurrent failure, particularly um, that those patients should definitely have pain mapping looked at. And if they have complex disease, uh, that, that endo is not ideal, that, that also those patients should be assessed by a more multidisciplinary team as opposed to working in silos. So those two things, if they don't exist at your center, find a way to make them exist. If they do exist at your center, kind of explore even making them a more important part of your overall strategy here is what I would say. Great. And, and Peter, give us the, your perspective. What, what changes in your day-to-day -day now with these results in hand? Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, on this, uh, you know, one, one bright side on the outcomes of, you know, death and amputation and the poor quality of life is that there's a lot of room to move the needle that we, you know, obviously we have our work cut out for us, but, you know, it, this is a lot better than, than um, it, it, the opportunity here is huge that, to make an impact on this extremely vulnerable population. But I think, I think for, for me, um, the, uh, you know, some of these subsequent studies are going to help me know how to apply this better. Uh, but I also think that, uh, 
that you know the volume flow you get with a bypass is pretty good. And so uh, the challenge is that you know when you see that quotes healthy CLTI patient, it's kind of like an oxymoron. Um, most of them have a lot of risks, and so making sure that that patient isn't at prohibitive risk or unacceptable risk for surgery, I think, is you know something we've a little bit gotten away from in the endo era. I think we need to go back to it. Like uh, I agree with Tony on that. And then um, lastly, I think one big application is going to be that uh, we'll be talking to each other a lot more, which is, you know, and I think Tony also mentioned this, this really opens up the possibility to really make this truly multidisciplinary in a way I think will benefit the patients ultimately. And, uh, and that, that's pretty exciting. Great. Um, can we bring up the poll results, please, um, to get a sense of, you know, how easy it is for people to get, and depending, you know, I know it varies by specialty and, and where you practice, but it seems, you know, the majority can get a, you know, vein mapping within, within a week, which is good. And, and I know that some have issues getting that, especially depending on their practice. And this could be a limitation, as we need to mention um, as well, not just the Availability of the vein, also, you know, a, a surgeon who's ex experienced enough to 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 do the uh, the surgery. Matt, let me ask you about the. Um, there's a lot of talk about sub analyses, and you know, talking especially about you know the angiographic follow up data. Um, can you tell us about you know what their future plans for sub analysis, especially outcomes by intervention type, location? You know, you know, and, and as we look at it, if you have a you know focal tibial lesion that you know it's so easy to do angioplasty for, versus a, a long CTO SFA popliteal trifurcation disease, very complex, and you know, in our hands, I mean, the experience with with these are um, going to be varied. So, um, can you just shed a light if you have any data on this, or is there ability to do sub analysis on, on this in the future? Um, <clears throat> thanks for the question, sir. Here, no, we, we don't have very much data. No, I'm kidding. Um, just to give you guys a sense of the complexity of the data set, we have 17 individual anatomic segments, and there's been some confusion based on some of the appendix tables in the, in the main paper, and you can imagine the complexity. You've got intention to treat, you've got as treated, you've got the, which includes the, the crossovers, and, you know, just to take one example, the balloon edge plastic alone, Alec uh, alluded to it. There's a kind of a whisper that 40% of patients had balloon angioplasty alone as their endo treatment, and the the appendix in the in the uh, New England Journal paper was um, by segment, and it was not by patient. So we're you know we're scurrying to try to get as much data out as quickly as we can, just to to try to shed light on all the questions that were raised. But you know we do have an enormous number of, of sub studies planned. We have a full cost effectiveness. Uh, kind of analysis that's coming. We're going to do an absolute dive into all of the details of, of open surgery, all the details of endo, including one of the questions that Peter raised. Uh, you know, it's been a mantra in the past. If you have a re-intervention after a failed endo or a failed surgery, what are, what's the impact of that so-called burning bridges? So, you know, if you count up the number of endo options and the number of anatomic segments, it's just an ocean of, of data that we're going to be tapping into. And certainly we're going to look at the angiogram data as well. Um, I just wanted to kind of follow up on one other comment that was made. And, you know, I do a, a lot of open, I do a lot of endo. I like to think my technical success rate is low in the kind of low single digits. To me, it's, it's far less about technical success. And, you know, I've said it a million times, but I'll say it a million more. I think we do the world such a disservice by kind of this construct of open versus endo. And Kenny and I or Alec are the most guilty because we're designing a clinical trial based on that, but they are two different complementary tools that we have. And again, I'll say it again, no one in their right mind would think about uh, um, sort of medical oncology competing with radiation oncology. They're just two complementary tools that the oncologists use, and these are two tools that, that we should use. And, you know, if, if you only do one, then absolutely kind of find someone that you trust and can work with that, that does the other. And if you do both, then, you know, it's a bit easier to wrestle with, but it's just such an important point. 
to me, it's all about the perfusion. And when I cut a toe off or debride a wound, you know, I'm looking at wounds all day, every day, 365 days a year. And I want to know, is it, is it going to bleed? You know, does it bleed when I cut into the skin? So to me, it's more about that and less about the technical component of it. Great, great comment, Matt. And I, I think everybody can agree with with that viewpoint. You're you're very zen with your answer, so I appreciate that. And you know, we'll, we're gonna we're going to um, we're gonna be close to wrapping up here. But Kenny's behaved himself, so we're gonna give him another question here. Ken, you know, the next steps here. You know, we've talked a little bit about you know, there's as we call this throughout this discussion a pragmatic trial, and so we know there's been some patient populations that have been a little bit more underrepresented women in particular, some of the different race and ethnicities. And we have an adjunctive uh, registry that's gonna be critically important that Viva um, helped uh, sponsor. Can you give us a little bit of your perspective on what the role that registry is gonna play and how we really put these results in perspective to the day-to-day -day clinical practice across the country and the world? So you want me to take the gloves off, Eric? Is that it? <laughs> that was an easy one. We can take the gloves off. That's a softball, man. Um, honestly, we look, there's a lot of um, concern about the trial. There's a lot of, you know, people are almost lining up on both sides of the fence about this thing. And it's actually, I, I totally agree with Matt that these are complementary therapies. And we need to think very carefully about every patient individually that we see and what is the best strategy for that person. Um, we, need we have a responsibility as trialists to actually shed more light on that because i i don't know what they you know if i were to have a, a designed the ideal trial if we had all the money in the world um and matt actually was willing to actually give all of his fortune to this trial uh <laughs> then <laughs> his millions then we would have been able to have a core lab looking at every every uh angiogram uh, 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 both before and after, we would have had a conjunct, a, a concurrent registry showing what patients were not enrolled because we know, you know, as with any clinical, you know, prospective randomized pragmatic trial, not everybody's going to be enrolled. There's not going to be consecutive enrollment. So it's critically important to know who wasn't enrolled and what their characteristics were and versus who was enrolled. And the, the original plan was to have that concurrent registry. We could never really get it off the ground for financial and other reasons. But um, at the very least, we do have a, um, Viva was instrumental in really creating and funding um, a registry that's being run in conjunction with Duke, Viva and BEST. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, Manesh Patel and Sri can't remember his last name, I can't, uh, but have been running this uh, trial, this registry. It's got about, I think it was originally planned for 1,200 patients. NIH has also funded it to some degree. And it'll end up with about 1,000 patients. And it will give us, it's at, at our clinical sites. And the hope is that, that, that most patients have been enrolled more consecutively in that registry. So we'll get a better real world look at what, what, what this, what the the uh, you know what the uh, population of patients with CLI is at these at these sites and what and what therapies are being applied, um, you know I, I we we Matt and myself and Alec truth be told and I don't, I think it's fair to say this we we go to toe to toe about this because I I I want to know what are the patients that were enrolled I don't think a, I I think it was a relatively you know a, a I won't say small, but it was a, a smaller proportion of patients that were enrolled than were not enrolled. And what's different about those patients? Were they high surgical risk? And in, in the opinion of the operator, were they high endovascular? I mean, were they were they low endovascular risk, i.e., good endovascular candidates, and therefore the there wasn't equipoise in the eye, in the eyes of the investigator? I mean, these are questions that we need to answer in order to be responsible about this and to be able to to inform the, the world about what to do when you see an individual patient and where do they fit in this scheme? Great, I mean, um, this is great. And, and, and I'm glad that Matt can, can help us kind of put this in perspective. I mean, I think, you know, what was published, was presented is, is the first step. It looks like there's a lot of data to go through. 
um, to kind of glean, you know, all these it's devil in the details of like what patient is is best fit and what is the local expertise. Um, uh, can, can you please put the, the last poll here, just to kind of try to get a, a pulse from the audience after after listening to this, and, and we had a lot of great interaction, a lot of great questions. We had, um, you know, excellent attendance uh, of this session. Um, so would the best sale I change your practice? Um, meaning that, uh, you know, if you were, you know, at primarily going into first, and, you know, in Dr. Farber's, you know, talk earlier, can I, you know, ask or, you know, indicated that endo first may not be the, uh, the answer. And for a lot of people, it, it has been endo, endo first, for example, or, um, maybe maybe bypass first. So um, you know, looking for the equipoise, looking for um, maybe you know if you if you have a patient with a single vessel peroneal runoff and a long occlusion, um, you in the past were not getting the, you know pain mapping. Maybe you need to know the quality of the pain before sticking that peroneal artery, for example, and you know uh, knowing that. So that is something that we'll uh, we'll see. I'm just kind of curious to see what uh, what people think of um, you know if if this will change the practice or not and. Uh, can you pull uh, put the results, please? Um, I think we're I think we're still collecting. Should we? Uh, there still we go. collecting. Okay, I'll just let it roll for um, for a second. Let it roll. And, uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask it. a question if it's I'm gonna entertain yes. us for a moment while we let the poll go. Matt, what did you do to celebrate when this trial completed? Because I know this has been <laughs> a big. And what hobbies do you have back now? What do you, what is back in your life now that Best CLI <laughs> is uh, behind you? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I uh, got a little bit more sleep and uh, traveling a little bit less, but uh, no, it's been it's been fun. It's been so rewarding, and you know, the biggest one of this one of the many rewards is actually going around and meeting so many people that are just quietly doing their thing, just either outstanding endo care, outstanding surgical care, or both. Uh, we were blessed to have a clinical question that somehow is as relevant today as it was when we conceived the trial. That's kind of mind boggling and highlights again, the data void that we were trying to help help fill. But, you know, the support that we got when we needed it at a critical moment was, you know, also heartening. And so it's been, you know, it's just been rewarding. And all along, again, the, the point was that this is the first step and and trying to light a fire under the next generation of, of folks, yourself included, to you know take the ball and run with it. And we've got a lot to do to catch up to, you know, our colleagues in the oncology world and the cardiovascular world and lots of other fields. So it's been a lot of fun. I got to know Kenny a lot better too. Uh, yeah, Ken. Ken, yeah. What do you do to celebrate? Take us home. Oh, I. Uh... I, uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I, 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 I went to Viva. <laughs> there you go. And and Matt returned to his hobby, his most most favorite hobby of doing bypass. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but uh, um, no, I think it's uh, listen. This trial is really really important. I mean, I think it. The, you know, you know, you said it, Peter. Uh, that what's really amazing is a third of patients are dead at two and a half years. That's just like, we, we, we need to do better in so many ways. Uh, the medical therapy was not, was, was revealed to be not nearly as good as we need to be doing on these patients. And we, I mean, we, this is what I hope is that this shines a light on CLTI, uh, for the world and, and, just informs the whole a whole new set of clinical trials that will get that will drill down on this stuff. And I listen, quite frankly, the, the first question you asked was, were you surprised by the results? I wasn't surprised, honestly. I figure that, you know, there are some patients that clearly are going to do better with bypass and I send them for bypass. So to me, it didn't really change my my it's I, it's probably not going to change my practice that much. It made me it, it will make me think a little bit more that bypass is a really good option for for patients that are good surgical candidates that are pretty challenging endo candidates and and um and that that's you need to think about that there's going to be a lot there's a lot of controversy i'd love to hear i, I wish there were more time you know yes. Benita, are you now going to do uh, uh are you going to do vein mapping on every patient now before i mean that's what people are saying i i i'm concerned that 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 the pendulum swings too far the other way and i think we need to just 
take a breath and look at the results and digest them. But speaking of the results, can you show the results of the poll? Looks like half of the people said they will change their practice and the other half um, are not, if you can pull the results up. So, um, you know, and so that's something that, you know, can answer to your, um, or if you can pull, pull up the poll in the, in the main um, channel. Thank you. And it looks like ha half said that they would, you know, they'll just kind of change their practice, meaning they get, you know, potentially more day mapping and, and half uh, said they wouldn't. So I think we're running out of time. I think we, we kind of allotted, um, you know, more than an hour, hour and a half into it now. So I thank you so much uh, for the study leaders for, for being here and, 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 you know, your time and full, all your efforts in, the, in this, you know, really landmark trial. We really appreciate all the, all the efforts uh, you, you put in it. And um, I thank the panel and Viva board members for, for being here. Thanks, Eric, for working on this. Uh, with me and um, thanks for everyone who joined us and interacted on the chat. Uh, this the recording will be available, so you can uh, you can uh, watch this um, at any time. So hopefully everyone found this useful and uh, have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. All right, thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.